Yeah, what's up, CWC? How we doing? Are we good? Come on. One of us are good by showing their, 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 their hand clap for it. I love it. Amen. Well, I know I'm excited. I'm good. I'm excited to, to share with you guys the first part of a, a two-part series. And yes, I'm still seated in a chair, which is terrible. Hallelujah. But I am trying to be obedient, sort of like part way. I'm not sure if there's grace there, but I'll, I'll take it anyway. I'll proclaim grace. But now I'm excited to bring this first part of this two-part series that we have actually titled Crowned. Come on, look at your neighbor. Say crowned. 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 Look at him again and say, Jesus is king. Jesus, Jesus is king. Amen. And, and so look, we're going to hop right into this thing. You guys ready for a word? Yeah. yeah. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Awesome. And we're going to be in the gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, grab them. Matthew, Mark, Luke. <clears throat> if you don't have your Bibles, come up front here. We're going to pray for you. And uh, I'm ornery today for some reason. Luke chapter 19. And, and so we're going to look at Luke's account of the gospel. Which, which by the way, I, I love his account. Because I really like the perspective I really like his perspective. So, so let me give you like a little bit of a Wikipedia page on, on our author, okay? So Luke is a physician and he's hired by this, name, this man named Theophilus who is this, this great man of great wealth and he's got a high position in the Roman Empire. And so Theophilus hires Luke to do a job. He's hired to do a job. He's hired to investigate Jesus, He's hired to investigate him. He's, he's hired to do this job to, to do some investigative journalism, right? That's what he's hired to do. Find out the truth. Did Jesus really do all the things that these people are saying that he, that he did? This is Luke's entire mission, the life of Jesus. Was Jesus really who people say he, he is? Now, <clears throat> what's really, really interesting about this, this report that he has to write is what is at, at stake here. See, Luke has to tell the truth. It's not like he should tell the truth because it would be immoral or unethical if he didn't tell the truth. No, no, no. His life depends on it. If he's caught adding or subtracting anything from the truth, he would have lost his very life. So this is what is writing on this gospel of count, right? This, this investigative report that actually we now know as the gospel of Luke. He's got to make sure that this thing has a fact checker on it, right? And he can, you can check all the facts. So prayerfully, he's not like President Trump and just says whatever. But <laughs> however, so we hope, we hope that he's telling, telling the truth because his life actually d depends on it. Now, now, one of the things that aren't certain uh, about, about Luke is if he's a Jew or a Gentile, okay? There's conflicting reports. Some say he's, he's a Greek. Others say that that he is a, a, a Hellenistic Jew. However, it, it's not, not certain, which then segues into the other uncertainty of Luke. We're not sure if Luke was saved before he wrote the gospel account. We're not sure. We're not sure if he was saved. We don't know if he was a believer or a non-believer before he started to investigate the life of Jesus. But what we do know for certain is that after he wrote the gospel of Jesus, after he investigated the life of Jesus, this man became sold out and on fire for Jesus. He becomes this incredible evangelist, declaring the word of Jesus, the life of Jesus to everyone and anyone that would listen. Matter of fact, his zeal and his hunger for Christ actually caused him to lose his life for Christ. He ended up later losing his life because of his belief in who Jesus is. And why do I say all that? I say all that, one, to give us a little contextual context to why he wrote, wrote it the way he did. But also, man, listen, to show the proof that you wouldn't lose your life for something you didn't believe in or that you didn't fact check and cross and verify. And so here this man, he, he writes all of this amazing stuff about Jesus because he found it to be, to be true. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 28. And it says this. And when he had said these things. I'm going to stop there for a moment. This is talking about Jesus. The he is Jesus. And when Jesus said these things. See the teacher part of me. 
It's almost like I have this switch, right? When I sit down, I gotta go into teacher mode. I, I don't understand it, but I do. I like, swoop, I, I change it. I feel like, uh, what's that, that movie, Over the Top, Sylvester Stallone. Like, he's like, when I, when I put the thumb over the top, it's like a switch that goes off. When I sit down, it's like a switch that goes off and all of a sudden I begin to teach. But anyway, <clears throat> a few laughs. I thought it'd be funnier than that. It's okay, no problem. Anyway, the teacher side of me won't just let me breeze over this statement and after he said these things. So we're gonna back up. We're gonna look a little bit at what he said before he said these, these things in verse 28. And if we look back in the beginning of Luke chapter 19, we see the story of Zacchaeus. How many of you know the story of Zacchaeus? Come on, I'm gonna make you guys engage with me. How many of you know? Come on, sing the song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Yeah, we, I'll start beatboxing. Just kidding. There we go. Got to loosen it up in here a little bit. No, but, but this, this story of Zacchaeus is, a, is an amazing story, right? He climbs up in the sycamore tree to see the Lord walking by. Now, now here's the thing about Zacchaeus. He's a bad dude. And I don't mean like bad good. You, you, how many of you watch Sports Center, right? Stephen A., he, he calls Aaron Rodgers a bad man. It actually means he's really good. This, this, I'm not talking about he's bad good. I'm talking about he's a bad, bad dude. Like, okay, he would steal from his own people. He would lie on his own people. He would lie to his own people for, for one, one reason, man. Selfish motivation, selfish gain, selfish preservation. This is the reason why Zacchaeus did the things that he, that he did. Until one day, he encounters Jesus. He encounters the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And his life would never be the same ever again. I can relate to this. The moment I encounter Jesus, my life will never be the same. I can't go back to what, what I once was because of who he is. And this is what happens to Zacchaeus, right? He encounters Jesus and and it's crazy because all of these terrible things that, that Zacchaeus did, not that it didn't matter to Jesus, but Jesus just knew how powerful he was and how he could cover what Zacchaeus had already done. Jesus takes the time to, to go and come after Zacchaeus. Amen. And it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And his life has changed. Zacchaeus' life has changed forever. Matter of fact, Jesus made such an impact on this man in such a short time that while Jesus was still there talking with him and eating with him, he gave away half of what he had ever made. Half of his wealth he gave away to the poor. This is a man who used to steal from the poor just to gain more wealth. Now he gave away half of his wealth to the poor. He gave away four times, paid back four times the amount that he had stolen after one encounter with Jesus. It's incredible. It's incredible. Now, while Jesus is still there sitting with Zacchaeus, talking with him, loving on him, ministering to him. There's these religious leaders there and they, they begin to ridicule and murmur and grumble about what Jesus was doing there. And, and they begin to say to, to those around, how could he sit and eat with this sinner? How could he talk to the sinner? Which leads us to the, to the thing that he said leading into verse 28. Because Jesus says this in that, in that story. He says, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. Amen. It's amazing. I love that statement. And here's why, because I know I was once lost and I would have remained lost. I needed Jesus to come find me. I needed Jesus to come and change me. If he didn't, I would still be lost. If he didn't come for the broken, I would have remained broken. If he didn't come to set the captive free, I would have still remained in bondage. But, but Jesus, see, he, he did this thing and he said this thing. He makes this statement, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. And, and because of that, now I can say, and we all can say, although I once was lost, now I am found. I was blind, but, but now I see, man. I was dead, but now I'm alive in Christ Jesus. It's incredible. This was one of the things he said. Another thing that he said starts in verse 11. And when you get into verse 11, you see Jesus doing the parable of the 10 minas. 
And I'm not gonna focus on the entire story because that's a, a lot to go through in the little bit of time. I've got like 15, 20 minutes left with you. So I'm, I'll make it really quick. But one thing he did say was this, since you've been faithful with very little, I'm going to bless you and give you charge over much. What a beautiful truth that is. If we are faithful with the little that God gives us, he is faithful to bless us with much. It's a beautiful truth. But you know what I find to be true also? Is that truth will cause a lot of us to stumble over what others have. It's so true, man. It's funny, I'll tell you a story. You guys ready for a story? You okay with the story? We got time for a story? Okay. So I remember this one time, this guy comes up to me, right? And this is what he says to me, some of the things I got to endure as a, as a pastor. He, he walks up to me and he says, I can't believe you have everything that you have. And he begins to list all the things that God has blessed me with. And I am incredibly blessed, I know that. But he gives, begins to bless the, like, list them for me, all my blessings, like I didn't know them and didn't live in them, right? So like, I was like, praise the Lord, thank you for the revelation, dude. But he starts to list them out, right? Like he's like, you got a beautiful wife. I was like, I'll take you outside and whip you. No, I'm just kidding, but like, <laughs> You got a beautiful wife, you got two beautiful kids, and you got this great ministry. You have all these amazing things. Why why do you think you deserve all of it? Now, I could have chose to be really offended at this, right? Like, why are you attacking me, dude? You don't know me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you don't know me. But I didn't. didn't. And here's the reason I didn't get offended is because I'm gonna tell you right now, I know I don't deserve any of it. I know God has just blessed me with it. Okay, and so, so I, I didn't get offended by it. Instead, I just looked at the guy and I smiled, you know, had my pastor's face on and my pastor's hat, <laughs> trying to put my Jesus face on full front. Right? You know what I mean? like, but I didn't get offended. I, but I did say this to him. I said, man, I, I don't deserve it. You know, God blessed it, blessed me with it. However, scripture does say, and I, and I quoted what Jesus had said, one of the things Jesus said, since you are faithful with little, God will bless you with much, is what I said to him. But he he wasn't ready for that. Like he wasn't trying to hear any of that. You know what I mean? He just wanted to vent about what he didn't have, what he felt he deserved. And, and so he was taking it out on me. He was, he was upset with his life and started to look at my life. And because God had, had blessed me, he became upset about it. But here's the thing, right? Later on, I was, this was days removed after I left the guy. And this was behind me. I wasn't even thinking about it anymore. I dealt with multiple other crazies from then. But however, I like, no, I'm just kidding. But, sort of. But anyway, so after, after I got on the other side of that, right, I, I literally, this is for real, I was in my prayer time and I was spending time with Jesus. And, and the Lord brought back that exchange to me. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said to me, he goes, that guy didn't know your story. He doesn't know your story. He was just seeing the fruit of your labor. He didn't see the labor that brought the fruit. He didn't see any of that. He didn't see all the years that you've spent crying on your face before me, humbling yourself before me. He didn't see all the time that you spend in my word studying to show yourself approved. He he didn't see all the times that you've you've spent leaning in and learning from me, taking my yoke upon you for it's, it's easy and my burden for it's light. He didn't see all of that. And so how could he, how could he sit there and judge you on it? And you know, it's really funny because if the guy would have seen what my first ministry entailed, I promise you he wouldn't have wanted that. I guarantee it, man. For the first few years of ministry, I had 12 men in a men's home and I had to clean the bathroom every day after 12 men coming off of drugs and off the street, right? This was my first ministry that I had to do for multiple years. And, and look, I, I worked months and months on end with no pay, no recognition, no nothing. I just did it for the glory of God. Because see, this is what I knew. I knew God had put these men's restrooms in my hand for me to have control over and charge over. And I made sure that those restrooms were the cleanest restrooms that anybody had ever seen, especially those who had ever seen 12 men use one, right? So it's like, they were incredibly clean. But because I was faithful with that little, God now has blessed me with, with much. Not that I deserve it, just because God has blessed me with it and and because he will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask, think, or imagine as we lean into him and go after him. And so look, one of the the things that that the Lord showed me through this was, man, don't be looking at what others have, being upset 
by what you think you deserve. Instead, focus on what God has given you right now, what you have charge over right now, and do the best with that thing. And watch God start to multiply that thing. Because in his faithfulness, if you're faithful with little, his faithfulness will bless you with a lot. It's just the way God works. And it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. And that's one of the things that Jesus said while leading into to verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, verse 29. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the, at the mount that is called Olive. He sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat before. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner came out and said, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Incredible. They're declaring this is it. Blessed is the king. They're crowning him him king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, you know something that I find to be really cool about scripture? I love this about scripture. Is how with every different perspective can come a different revelation. Every different perspective can bring a different revelation to us. Because here's the truth of the matter. We all have a different vantage point in life, every one of us. And anyone in scripture, especially those in the midst of the scriptures, all of them have a different vantage point of the way they are seeing this story unfold in front of them. They're all seeing it differently. There's a different perspective. And our perspective a lot of times will determine our revelation. It really will. And so in this this story, the triumphal entry, right? The scripture calls the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. There are a few different perspectives at play here, right? There's a few. And we're gonna go through four different perspectives this morning. And one of the perspectives would have been those in the crowd. Not those in the crowd that were declaring, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. But the people in the crowd that just came because they heard the stirring and the commotion in the crowd. So they came to see what was going on, right? They were nosy, (laughs) I'd have been one of them people. Like, hey, I'm gonna go see what's happening. It's really loud out there. Like, I'm gonna go check this out. See, they're they're not there to declare him king or to crown him king. Instead, they're just coming there to see who he is. What is all the fuss about? What's happening around him? So let me go see what he's all about. I'm not sure about this man named Jesus. I've heard of him, but I don't know him. I'm not ready to crown him, but yet I do wanna see what he's all about all about that would have been one perspective people who just aren't sure they're not sure let's go let's go see now the other perspective in the story would have been the pharisees perspective the pharisees these religious leaders they're they're, they're watching this all unfold in front of them and here's what you have to understand about these these pharisees they already had jealousy and hatred towards jesus they already did They already did, why? Because Jesus was turning the world upside down. He was literally flipping the script on the way you did things in life, according to God. That's what he was doing. I mean, he was doing all kinds of things backwards from the way they'd always done him. He's eating with sinners. He's befriending the least of these. He's he's healing the sick, okay? He's delivering those who are demon possessed and he's showing people the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. And man, the Pharisees didn't. They didn't like it. They didn't like it one bit because why? The light of the world had come and was shining his light and it revealed the darkness that was residing inside of them. And so they had this jealousy and hatred towards him. And as they're watching this, right? Jesus riding down on a donkey down the side of a mountain. He's riding down and and all these people are declaring him king. Blessed is the king who comes. They're throwing their cloaks down on the ground as this donkey. They didn't even want the hooves of the donkey hitting the dirt. 
This is how much they were elevating him and worshiping him. They were like, man, you, you can step on my own coat. I don't care. I just don't want the, the donkey to even step on the ground because you are high and lifted up. This is what they were, that's what they were doing. And they're praising him as king. And, and here are the Pharisees, man, they, they are hating this. They're hating this. And as they're watching it, right, they begin to, to wish what he had. <laughs> but they're unable and unwilling to do what he'd already done and what he's about to do. But this is their, their perspective. And, and because this is their, their perspective, the, the revelation of their jealousy and their hatred towards him grew and grew and grew until several verses later, they're saying, crucify him. This is how much this revelation of their hatred grew towards him because of the, spec, the, the, the perspective that they had towards him. That's one perspective. The next one would have been Jesus's perspective, which is a perspective like no one else's perspective by the way, because Jesus has a, a heavenly perspective. And see, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways as the heavens are higher than the earth so are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts, right? So, and there's the depths of his, his, his understanding no man can, can fathom, why? Because he has a heavenly perspective. He is seeing through the eyes of eternity while all of this is unfolding. See, Jesus knows that everything was created for him, by him and through him, that nothing was created outside of him that was created at all. He knows this. He, he knows all of this and he knows what he has to do and what he is about to go do. It's crazy. He knows that he who knew no sin has to become sin so that we could be called the righteousness of God. Jesus knows this. This is his perspective as he's, he's writing down. He knows he's writing into his certain death. That's what he knows. But because he has a heavenly perspective, he has peace in the midst of his earthly circumstances. It's incredible. It's incredible. You know what I find a lot of times is for us, right? We find ourselves bound by fear, anxiety, depression, because we think this is it, right? This is it. This is just this is just it, right? Because of all the different things that life tries to bind us with. We think, man, this is it. This is, this is just the way life is. I've got to deal with it. I've got to figure out how to, to make my way, my way through it. Why? Because we, we don't have a heavenly perspective. We don't have a heavenly perspective. But, but see, this is what Jesus did. This is what scripture says. It says that he came and he brought the kingdom of heaven. Meaning this, he brought with him the peace that surpasses all understanding. Matter of fact, Jesus looks at us and looks at his disciples. This is what he says. He says, my peace, I give you. My peace, I leave with you. In other words, I'm leaving the kingdom of God to reside inside of you, which is, which is me. Jesus has joy unspeakable, strength undeniable. And it's incredible, but because we don't have a heavenly perspective, these things that this earth tries to throw at us, man, bind us and we don't have peace in the midst of the storm we need a, we need a heavenly perspective our perspective has to to shift so we don't think that that this is it <laughs> this is just the way life is because jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly and so here's jesus's perspective he's he's coming down right this mountain he knows what he's about to have to do and here's the thing right he knows that he's going to be beaten for for our transgressions. He knows that he's gonna be bruised for our iniquities. That the chastisement that brings us peace was placed upon him. He knows all of that's about to happen to him. He knows he's about to die. And, and look, if that won't cause fear, anxiety, or depression, I'm not sure what will. Like I know I'm about to die, the most horrific death. But because Jesus has this heavenly perspective, his earthly circumstance has no hold on him. See, what happens is, is if, if, we don't, if our perspective doesn't shift from earthly to heavenly, then our earthly circumstances will stop us from fulfilling what God has called us to do. I promise you, it will try to stop us. And Jesus, if he had focused on his earthly circumstances, it could have caused him not to do what God had called him to do. That's another perspective. He has this heavenly perspective. He's seeing through the eyes of eternity. This is Jesus. 
There's one more perspective I want to talk about. You guys okay? You still with me? You still with me? Okay. Other perspective is the disciples' perspective. This is a pretty cool perspective if, if you look through their eyes because you've got to read the entire story to know what is happening here. You got to know the entire story because it really adds to the gravity of what's taking place. Because these disciples would have followed him for three years, every day, all day. They would have ate with him. They would have drank with him. They would have prayed with him. They'd have slept beside him. They'd have got to see and witness thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands come to him and receive their healing. It's incredible. They'd have got to see all this. They'd have got to see these these people come and receive deliverance the moment that he spoke to them. They'd have watched Lazarus. Right? They'd have watched Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth. They'd have watched this mummy come walking out of the grave after four days, not even looking like the walking dead, looking straight healthy and happy and ready to go. He's just yelling out, get these stinking gods off me. They watched, they watched Jesus as he walked into a, to a funeral wake, a little girl. They laid her down because they, they said she was dead. She had died. And so they lay her down and everybody's there to, to pay their condolences to the family, okay? And, and the disciples walk in with Jesus and Jesus kicks everybody out of there. Everyone out. Everybody get out. So that when the disciples leave, they look back, okay? And they see this little girl dead and Jesus standing beside them, beside her. Only to moments later, turn around and watch Jesus walking out of the house with this little girl who once was dead, now alive and completely well. They're, they're watching all this. They're watching the lepers being healed. They're seeing deaf ears opened and demons flee at the very sound of the voice of Jesus. I can't even imagine seeing this. I can't imagine seeing Jesus, right? Take two fish and five loaves of bread, feed over 5,000 people with it. He just broke it, blessed it, fed them all until they had leftovers. They watched every bit of this. There were so many things. Matter of fact, there were so many things that Jesus did. This is what the gospel of John says. It says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did that if every one of them had been written down, the world, the entire earth wouldn't have enough room in it to hold the books that it would take to write all the miracles he did down. Think about that. And the disciples would have got the witness, if not all of them, most of them what he had did in his three years of ministry while here on this earth. It's incredible. It's literally incredible. And so now, finally the day arrives. Finally this day arrives. And they are thinking, this is it. Our king has come. He's going to be crowned king. But what you have to understand is their perspective was, was off too. See, they had a also an earthly perspective as well. They thought that he was going to get this earthly kingdom. They thought he was coming in to, to rule right here on earth. See the triumphal entry, what it represented there is the coronation of a king. This is how the, the kings of old, right, came to receive their kingdom. They would ride in mounted on a donkey and their people would come and receive them. They, they would ride in to the city of Jerusalem declaring their, their kingship while everybody else declared it with them all the people would have came and praised them. And so the disciples would have known all about that. And they'd have heard all the stories of David and Solomon being coronated as kings. And, and now they're recognizing the similarities between the stories they were told about David and Solomon and all the other kings. And they're seeing this man that they knew that they walked with for three years coming to be crowned. This is it. We're about to get a palace and some servants. <laughs> That's literally what these guys are thinking. They recognize all this. This is it. It's, they're gonna, he is going to be crowned. But yet their perspective was, was off. And, and it was funny when I was studying this, right, for this message, because it's actually out of my comfort zone a little bit sitting and teaching. Like I'm a preacher more than I am a teacher. But, but this is what, what God had, had kept taking me back to. He kept taking me back to the different perspectives throughout the scripture. And, and not to take away from the main objective of the story, Palm Sunday, right? It's an amazing story. And, and, and the main objective to the story was for Jesus to, to receive a formal crowning, right? In a moment from the people. That was the main objective, right? To fulfill the prophecy found in Zechariah 9.9. 9. 
He was there to fulfill this prophecy that says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's the main object. That's the main objective. That's the main narrative of the story. However, with each and every one of these different perspectives can come a different revelation. That's what I felt like the Lord spoke to me. Because these different perspectives that we've seen through this this story can show us either where we are or where we used to be. It really can. And look, we can allow God to utilize each one of these perspectives to take us from where we are to where he is. Because each one of us at some point in time in our life can relate to at least one of these different perspectives, I promise you. And and I really felt like today, it was real simple that what I felt like the, the Lord was speaking to me was that there are going to be some here that just aren't sure about this Jesus. Like, like those in the crowd. They're just not sure, even like Zacchaeus, right? They're just not sure. They're not sure about who he is, but they wanna, they wanna come and they wanna hear a little something about him. They wanna kind of see what's, what's, all the, what's all the hubbub about, right? Like, what's, it, what's it all about? I wanna go see who this Jesus is. Let me, let me go see. And the cool thing about that is, that, that perspective is that I love talking to people who, who are just trying to see. They're trying to do some research because I know Jesus is searching for them. And so that when Jesus finds them and, he, and they find him, their life will be changed forever, just like Zacchaeus is. There's some that, that have that perspective. They're just not sure, okay? But then there's others of us here today actually have this different perspective of a Pharisee's perspective where we're actually angry with God because of the things that we're going through in our lives. We've, we've now cast excursions upon him and now we're angry with him because we're not happy with the way our life is turning out or where we are currently placed in life and and this gets spewed upon God we're jealous about what others have and looking at those things thinking we deserve what, what others have and here's the thing I felt like the Lord is trying to pull us from that place because he has so much more for us and it doesn't have to be it this, this, this isn't it this isn't what he has in store, man. He has, he has joy unspeakable. He has pleasures at his right hand. They're, they're forever, forevermore. But there's some of us that, that are thinking, man, that this, this is it. And Jesus saying, no, 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 this isn't it, man. You don't have to be angry with me. I, I, and you know what's cool about God? God? God doesn't get offended by our anger. And he's not afraid of it. There's been multiple times in my life where I've been angry with God because I didn't think I deserved where I was at. Because I felt like my faithfulness deserved more. You know what God did with that time? He utilized it to give me revelation of who he is. Of this slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love that God has for us. It's it's incredible. Then there's this other perspective where, man, we think that this is it. But our perspective is off. It's like the disciples' perspective. We think that, that because we've received all of our earthly dreams that We've received all these earthly goods and all these things that we've, we now have in our lives. We think, man, this is, this is it. This is it. Just like the disciples. The disciples literally thought they were gonna get a palace. That's what they thought. They thought, man, we're gonna get a palace and, and our Roman oppressors are gonna be overthrown. They're gonna be defeated by Jesus because he's about to be crowned with this, with this, earthly, this earthly crown. But Jesus had so much more in store for us and for them than just some earthly crown. See, he isn't looking to give us earthly possessions. He's looking to crown us with a heavenly crown. That's what Jesus has for you and I. And he's saying these earthly things just, this isn't it. I have so much, so much more. I have more to give you, more to offer you. I have more of me to give to you. Do you know he is the resurrection and the life? He's the resurrection and the life. And here's the cool thing that no matter the perspective that we're coming from, really doesn't matter because Jesus is the answer to all of them. He's the answer to every single perspective, no matter where we are in our lives or the way we are viewing life. Doesn't even matter. 
because he's the answer for them. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And if we run to him, we will find in him everything that we need. Everything that we need is found in him. And when we, when we live for him and we give our lives to him and we, and we crown him king of our, of our hearts, then we will truly say, this is it. He is everything that my soul longs for. He's everything that my heart has been thirsting for. This is it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Jesus, Lord, I lift up every heart in this place. And I pray that we would see this triumphal entry for what it was. Now, Lord, you are riding in to receive a heavenly crown so that you could crown us with heavenly things not with earthly things. I pray that. I pray that today, Jesus, that each and every one of us would would look for you and that we would find you so that you can take us from where we are and bring us to where you are. Lord, let us each have a perspective shift on the way we see this life. Let us see through the eyes of Christ. Let us have a heavenly perspective. Not not let us be so earthly minded that we are no heavenly good. Let us be heavenly minded. Let us set our things on above and not things below. And I pray that each and every one of us here would crown you king of our lives. head bowed, every eye closed still. I'm going to ask really quickly here, because I don't want to close the service without making sure that everyone has had an opportunity to give their hearts to Jesus. So listen, if you've never given your life to Christ, I'm just going to ask you to just lift your hand right where you are, really quickly. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you that each and every one of us here have given our hearts to you. And I pray no matter the perspective that we find ourselves in today, that Lord, you would shift it, that you would take us from glory to glory and faith to faith, that we would see through your eyes. Strengthen your people. (laughs) Touch your people, I pray. Lord, I love you. We glorify you. Have your way. Jesus, receive your glory throughout this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Listen, guys, we love you. God bless you. Enjoy your week.